I want to tell you a bedtime story. It's a story that comes from the ancient Greeks back in archaic times, and it's a charming story. I call it a bedtime story because it's part of Greek mythology, but I always imagine a mother or a father reading the story to his or her child as they tuck them off to bed, as parents all over the world do. As I'm reading the story, it's a story that involves humans and gods, as mythological stories often do. But I do want to have a philosophical question in the, the back of your mind and my mind as I, as I do so. One of the big questions in the history of philosophy and ideas more generally is why two and a half thousand, perhaps three thousand years ago, something changes and out of that change comes a culture, the classical Greeks who started to do philosophy and philosophical ethics systematically. All right. Could it be something to do with their mythology? Uh, one of the standard explanations turns to religion, and religion, of course, is a, is a type of philosophy. So here's the story. It's the story of Arachne and Athena. Arachne was a beautiful young woman and a most wonderful weaver. People traveled great distances to see her work at the loom. Her skilled fingers wove detailed, multicolored tapestries and rugs. Her skill was truly a work of art, and people paid large amounts of money for her creations. Eventually, all of the attention went to her head, though. Arachne started to brag and became boastful of her talents. Athena, the great goddess, has given you an amazing gift, Arachne, the villagers would often say. This comment made Arachne angry. Athena did no such thing. I taught myself to weave. No one can weave as well as I, not even Athena, who invented weaving. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, watched the boastful Arachne from her throne high on Mount Olympus. One day, she decided she'd had enough. And Athena disguised herself as an old woman and went to visit Arachne. I hear that Athena has given you a great gift, the skill of weaving, said the old woman. I am the best weaver, but Athena has nothing to do with how good I am. Her skill is no match for mine, stated Arachne. You are a talented weaver, Arachne, but you are a foolish girl. You should ask Athena for forgiveness, the old lady said, becoming angry. What? Ask for forgiveness? You are the foolish one. I am telling the truth, and if Athena is offended by my claims, she is more than welcome to pay me a visit. I would be more than willing to show her what real weaving looks like. I know that she could learn a thing or two from me, Arachne said confidently. With that, the old woman filled with rage and in the blink of an eye transformed back into the magnificent goddess Athena, all of the village people gathered around the powerful goddess and fell to their knees to honor her. All of the people except Arachne, for she seemed unimpressed by Athena's presence. You think you are better than I, Arachne? Well, let the competition begin, Athena proclaimed. Droves gathered to watch the weaving contest. Arachne and Athena both began to weave. Their fingers moved fluidly across the colorful threads. Athena wove glorious pictures of the gods and goddesses performing kind and heroic deeds. They were the most beautiful images the mere mortals had ever seen. Arachne's weavings were also gorgeous and perfectly constructed. Her cloths were also images of the gods but they portrayed them as angry and foolish. Athena was enraged when she saw how Arachne had depicted the gods. She was even more infuriated when she realized that her own skill was only marginally better than Arachne's. You are too boastful and rude, Arachne. How dare you make fun of the gods? Athena, beside herself, ripped Arachne's weavings to shreds, and she grabbed a stick and hit the girl repeatedly with it. At that moment, Arachne ran from Athena. Oh no, you won't run from me, Athena shouted. I will make sure that you, your children, and your children's children suffer. 
she magically altered Arachne. Arachne began to shrink until her body was a small black bead. She sprouted eight legs and grew black hair. Arachne became the world's first spider. He scurried to the highest place she could find and began weaving a web. Now you will be able to weave all day long, Athena said proudly. But from now on, no one will care about your talents. In fact, your delicate woven webs will be destroyed when people see them. In Stephen Hicks' newest book, Liberalism Pro and Con, Dr. Hicks examines 15 arguments for liberalism and 15 against in detail and expands upon the significance of each. Liberalism increases freedom. People work harder in liberal societies. People work smarter under liberalism. Liberalism increases individuality and creativity. Liberalism increases the average standard of living. The poor are better off under liberalism. Liberalism generates more philanthropy. More outstanding individuals flourish under liberalism. Liberalism's individualism increases happiness. Liberal societies are more interesting. Tolerance increases under liberalism. Sexism and racism decrease under liberalism. Liberalism leads to international peace. Liberalism is the most just system. Liberalism is more moral in its political practice. Summary and transition. Versus, humans are not intelligent enough for freedom. Human nature is too immoral for freedom. Liberalism is immorally self-interested. Liberalism's individualism is atomistic. Liberalism is materialistic. Liberal societies are boring. Power is the reality, so liberalism is naive. Liberalism does not guarantee that everyone's basic needs will be met. Liberalism is unfair. Equality is threatened by freedom. Scarcity means that freedom is dog-eat-dog. -dog. Liberalism is unsustainable. Liberalism is socially inefficient. Liberalism is merely another subjective narrative. Freedom does not exist. To get your copy of Liberalism Pro and Con, click on the link in the description of this podcast or hop onto the web and search for your copy of Liberalism Pro and Con. While you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast and follow us online on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Parler, and Minds. Now back to the podcast. Now, why do I take this story to be uh, not only fun as a bedtime story or a charming story for anyone anytime, but as significant to understanding the origins of philosophy and that you know, fascinating question of why of all the cultures and all the times, uh, it was the Greeks 26, 2700 years ago were the first to start doing philosophy systematically. And I do think a big part of the story does have to do with the uniqueness of Greek religion as uh, exemplified by stories like these that uh, most Greeks would have known and, and uh, being thoughtful people would have considered the significance of. Now, when we talk about the beginnings of philosophy in the textbooks, it's standard to say that Thales was the first philosopher, and I think there's a great deal of truth to that. But I've long had a hypothesis, I've not yet written this up, that since philosophy is such a sprawling discipline uh, covering issues of metaphysics and epistemology and human nature and ethics and social philosophy and aesthetics, that there is not one unified source uh, for all of the major philosophical issues. And so my working hypothesis is that, well, Thales is uh, first uh, for getting metaphysics in a philosophical sense off the ground. He was not clear that Thales and the Milesians were attending to the epistemological issues in a self-conscious way. And for a self-conscious reflection on the origins and standards of logic, I think uh, Parmenides deserves uh, significant credit for being the founder of philosophy in that area for, for epistemology. And when we turn to ethics issues, I, uh, I want to give credit in another direction, but uh, for that other direction, I'll save that for the end. I want to start with this story and uh, tease out what seem to be some of the philosophical implications that are going to take what are uh, kind of a collection of myths that make up a, a religion in the direction of a systematic philosophy philosophical ethics. Now, this first issue here is the issue of uh, causation in Arachne versus Athena, because what we have in the story quite clearly is a debate uh, over whether Arachne's great skill as a weaver is something that is a gift from the gods or the goddess in this particular case. And here, then, we have an understanding of 
human beings, and it's a traditional one, that is to say that human beings are made by the gods or they're made by God and they are endowed with certain talents. And so it's a matter of a, a kind of a, a natural slash supernatural working out of what is already there. But what we find Arachne doing as a human being is uh, arguing that, and taking credit for her own efforts in making herself into the excellent kind of weaver that she is. And so this then raises a, a kind of a core question then about our, our human nature and consequent questions about our human dignity, what we can and can't take pride and credit for. Do we, as human beings, make ourselves or are we made by the gods? And just having a story in which that question is raised in the sense of a conflict between two characters is significant. Now, closely related is the second issue of then credit. Suppose a human being does something that is noble, magnificent, wonderful, beautiful, and so forth. As a matter of justice, uh, someone deserves credit for that. But who should get the credit for it? Should I be thanking the gods or thanking the goddesses? Or, or, or should I be, if I'm the one who did this, uh, taking credit myself and feeling a certain amount of pride for that. And again, posting this uh, explicitly evaluative question in the form of a debate, does credit for all goodness that happens in the world uh, belong to the gods? Or is it the case that goodness has its causal origin in human decisions, human character, human action? And again, that's then a philosophically pregnant issue in, in ethics. And then, of course, we have the uh, the issue about Arachne, and the story puts it a couple of ways. One is uh, to say that she becomes boastful. She starts to, to brag that all of this attention that she's getting goes to her head, and so she's getting too much of a big head, and we're into the Greek concept of hubris here, quite obviously. But there does seem to be an issue of uh, what counts as a justifiable expression of pride in one's accomplishment. So if you really have done something well, and you think that uh, that having done something well was a result of your actions, uh, what exactly is wrong with feeling not only an internal glow of pride, but being able to stand tall, forthrightly, take uh, express rather your pride in, in what you have accomplished in a social context? And where do we draw the line then between an appropriate expression of pride versus something that goes beyond and is uh, and is too much? And of course, we do know something about the ancient Greeks, uh, the the originators of the the first Olympic Games. And one of the things that we do know is that those who are are, are awesome at uh, athletics, you know, they deserve to stand on the highest podium, and they should be able to stand tall and uh, kind of look down on everybody else for a while as a result of, uh, of their awesomeness. And there would be great prizes uh, a little bit later for the great tragedians and comedians and, and so forth. But then raising this explicitly as an issue in the story or in the myth of Arachne is again a step in the direction of a, a philosophical respect on ethics. If we turn to the other side of the uh, the divide here, we uh, might be criticizing uh, Arachne for having too big a head or, or engaging in too much boastfulness that's inappropriate. But it's also the case that uh, the god S is in the story brought out for a certain amount of uh, criticism. For example, there's Athena. She's up there on Mount Olympus watching Arachne uh, boasting and bragging and so forth. And she's getting irritated and she's uh, starting to feel there's a sense of injustice because uh, Arachne has got giving her the credit for, for her weaving talents. And so uh, Athena rather decides that if she's going to confront Arachne in some sense, but she doesn't just descend from the heavens and say, here I am, a, a Athena, in all my goddess glory, uh, justify yourself to me, and don't you think that you're doing me an injustice here? Instead, she does this roundabout route that seems to involve a disguise and a deception and is borderline perhaps entrapment. And then, uh, of course, the question that's uh, going to be raised and thought about is, you know, why 
do the gods and goddesses sometimes feel it necessary to disguise themselves to engage in in these kinds of behaviors if you know you want to know what someone thinks just ask the person why do you have to go through these deceptive tactics and we know that other human beings do it and it's kind of irritating when they do so uh, why do gods and goddesses do that and is that an appropriate kind of behavior now, a very striking thing then uh, to, to my to my way of thinking, where clearly the story to me is raising critical philosophical questions about traditional religion and is one of the things that is unique about the Greeks, as far as I know, is that once, of course, Athena gets so angry as, uh, as, uh, as Arachne is uh, standing her ground and, and, and taking all of the credit for her, for her accomplishments, Athena then throws away her disguise, reveals herself in all of her goddess splendor, and she's extraordinarily angry. But as soon as she appears in godlike form, what happens? happens is that all of the villagers realize who this old woman uh, really is. It's Athena. And then what they immediately do is they bow their heads, they go to their knees, and they abase themselves before the goddess. And by contrast, Arachne stands tall. She does not abase herself. And this is striking because then what we have is a consideration of very directly a consideration of the question about how humans and gods should relate to each other. Now, of course, the gods are superior in some respects, perhaps superior in their power, perhaps superior in their knowledge, right, and so forth. And so they are, they, they are owed some sort of reverence or worship, right, in some sort of a degree. But is it the case that in order to do that, that we human beings have to lower ourselves, that we have to bow our heads? Why can't we look the goddess in the eye? Why can't we say, yes, the gods and goddesses are pretty amazing, but also we, uh, we humans are pretty amazing too, and we should be able to, to stand tall. And so what we have here is a suggestion that a human being can stand up in the presence of a god. And as far as I know, in the history of religion, almost all of the other extant religions would say that the proper human posture with respect to the gods is abasement, to lower oneself, uh, even to the extent of uh, you know pressing one's face into the dirt and submitting to the will of the gods. And this uh, this is striking because uh, you know it uh, it's a kind of growing up analogy that I always think in terms of here. So you're a young woman or you're a young a young man, and of course all of your life your parents have been superior to you in power and wisdom and so on, and you respect them hopefully if they're good parents and you obey them if they are worthy of of obedience. But at a certain point you realize you're not a little kid anymore. And you can stand on your own two feet, and sometimes you can even stand up to your parents. You can, you can, uh, you can ask why. You can challenge them when they give you a command or make a suggestion about what you are supposed to do. And we admire this in young people, and we see it as a natural part of the, the human maturity. And so young people at a certain point realize that they are going to become more powerful, more wise, uh, and so they, they, they don't have to see themselves as children anymore. And what we have here in this myth, then, is a suggestion in a kind of a Greek fictional story or a Greek semi-religious story saying that, yes, we human beings can and should look up to the gods for their superior status, but we humans also are in a, in a, in a position of development, and perhaps we can become more godlike ourselves, and that what we should be striving for not is to go down on our knees and go down onto our bellies, but rather to strive for being able to stand tall and proud in the presence, that we can become more godlike. And that is a striking point about human dignity and human potential. Are you looking for a new book to dive into? Then check out audiobooks.com. With over 150,000 premium titles, they have an incredible selection of books to get stuck into, whatever your genre of preference. Listening to audiobooks makes reading incredibly easy and enjoyable. Not only do you have instant access to thousands of titles, but powerful narrators can bring the text to life, often giving a book more meaning than just flicking through the pages itself. Do more with audiobooks and start your next book while multitasking, doing the laundry, taking a drive, going for a walk, doing exercise or something else. With audiobooks, you can even read your books with your eyes closed. 
Sign up today for a 30-day free trial and get three audiobooks completely free. Go to www.audiobooks.com and click sign up to get started. And please help support the podcast by entering our promo code, Open College, which is all one word. Fall in love with books again with audiobooks.com. And while you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a view on your favorite media player. Now back to the podcast. Now, the next thing that's striking about this story is the nature of the challenge. Now, there's different versions of the Arachne myth that, uh, that come down, and sometime, some of them have Athena then challenging Arachne to a, to a competition, a weaving competition. More of them, I think, have Arachne then challenging Athena to the competition. And there's, again, an interesting issue here about particularly if it's the human doing it. And I, uh, in, in my heart of hearts, prefer that fusion there because, again, it makes me think of you know, the young son. I'll, I'll use the male versions of this. The young son, you know, as he's a teenager, starting to come into his own sense of, uh, of manhood and, uh, you know, recognizing that his dad has always beaten him in arm wrestles or other kinds of uh, physical contests and so forth. But that doesn't stop the young man from challenging his dad to, uh, to friendly matches uh, with the idea that maybe Maybe I can win this time. And you kind of admire the kid for being willing to stand up and challenge his dad. So in this case, we get uh, kind of a, a, a sense of sneaking admiration at the least for Arachne to be willing to challenge a goddess and to challenge a goddess on the goddess's home turf, so to speak, Athena being one of the goddesses, or the goddess rather, of, uh, of this particular craft. And then there's the nature of the, uh, the competition itself where they, uh, they both are clearly uh, at the top of their game and portraying important themes and, and exercising it uh, with a great deal of uh, craftsmanship and, and skill. But then the contrast in this, uh, this part of the story is, uh, again, to a more traditional and more universal religious attitude that we find that human beings should not dare challenge the gods, that uh, the gods are just so far exalted and human beings so far further down the chain of dignity that uh, it's just you know sacrilegious or impious even to think that you could challenge a, a god, you you lowly human, you're an insect, right? In my in my perspective, and so in this Greek story, we find a different conception of human god relationships being suggested. Now then, there's the competition itself. And the interesting thing about the competition is that uh, it's close. Again, there are different versions here. One version I've read, uh, an ancient version, has the competition being a tie. This version has it that Athena actually wins the competition, but it's a very close call. And as a result of that, she's angry. And it seems that she's angry in part just because the competition was so close. And so we get the goddess's response of anger. And the question that again gets raised here is about, to go back to the sportsmanship or sports analogy, is a kind of issue of sportsmanship. You know, if we think about the, the reasons why we think sports are an important part, not only of physical training, but also character training, one of the things that we, we want sports and games to do is to teach kids that sometimes you'll win and sometimes you'll lose. And it's important, of course, to learn how to be a good loser. And that's an important character step that we all have to go through to be able to uh, really want to be, to, to be successful at something and then to, to experience a, a crushing failure as a result of a sense of loss, but not turn into a, kind of a whiny, pouty kind of person who uh, who's not able to acknowledge that it was, a, uh, it was a good competition, you did your best, but someone else actually was the winner. So there are all of these character lessons about what goes into being a good sport and a good loser. But it also, of course, there's the flip side of that. Uh, part of uh, the character lesson is learning how to be a good winner and to be gracious, uh, to, of course, have pride in your accomplishment, but also to be gracious toward your competition, particularly if your competition acquitted themselves very well. And there's at least an implicit criticism here of Athena that she is not a good sport. She's not a good winner in this case. That, again, her attitude seems to be, uh, even in the face of uh, uh, Arachne, who has done something pretty amazing, to, uh, to, to be vindictive about it. That she uh, just can't, can't believe or can't accept the fact that a human being could be nearly as good as a goddess. And not only is she angry about that instead of being admiring, however... Uh, what the appropriate level of admiration should be here, but then vindictive to the point of uh, destroying the tapestry that uh, 
that uh, Arachne has, uh, has, has woven. And then, of course, there's the, uh, aside from the, the fact that the competition was close, there's the fact that the content of the two tapestries was quite different. Uh, Athena is doing a somewhat self-congratulatory or God-congratulatory theme. The gods are noble, dignified, beautiful, uh, engaged in various sorts of heroic actions. And Arachne, by contrast, has pros chosen rather to portray the gods doing foolish things and, and immoral things and inappropriate things and, and so forth. And so what Athena in part is angry is uh, or at is this portrayal of the gods. How dare a human point out the weaknesses of the gods and uh, to punish the, uh, the human for, for that apparent infraction. But of course, the question is going to be, is that really an infraction? I mean, if we're portraying the gods as angry and foolish and, and, uh, and overreacting on a fairly regular basis, which is what Arachne is doing, well, folded into the story is that that's a pretty good description of how Athena is acting. I mean, she is getting over the top angry pretty quickly and not acting in a particularly just fashion. So isn't it the case that what Arachne is doing is uh, not, of course, flattering, but nonetheless a, a somewhat accurate portrayal of the way the gods sometimes really are? And so this implicit criticism and the idea that we could criticize the behavior of the gods, uh, that is a very interesting question for a philosophical ethics, and to the extent that you go down that road, is going to have serious implications. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead, and his provocative account of master and slave moralities, and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claimed that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so, or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis, and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now, then, of course, there's a big question of justice and a big question of truth and, uh, you know, all myths. There's a moral of the story. And in this case, I think uh, there are two morals of the story. One is about justice. Was Arachne just in taking a lot of credit for who she became? Was Arachne being just in her portrayal of the gods? And then by contrast, was Athena being just in uh, trying to take all of the credit for Arachne's accomplishments? And was Athena being just in her treatment of Arachne? And of course, we then go, know that the uh, the punishment of Arachne goes further. Not only does it, Athena give her anger instead of some sort of uh, credit, she destroys uh, someone else's creation. She uh, picks up a stick or perhaps part of the, a weaving apparatus and beats Arachne with that stick. Is that the appropriate uh, kind of punishment for for what uh, for what Arachne has done, even if she's mistaken to some extent. She then transforms her into a spider. Well, is that an appropriate punishment for a, for a human being in this case? And not only that, she says that, yes, you are going to continue weaving, but everybody's going to hate your weavings now, and they're going to destroy them at the first opportunity. And it's not just going to be you, it's going to be your children and your children's children forever. And this is a pretty over-the-top goddess size. <laughs> uh, level of punishment. And of course, this is uh, kind of smacking us upside the head with the question of 
you know, the gods are charged with some sort of administration of justice, and they're supposed to be wise in their treatments and so on. But it seems to be pretty clear that uh, that Athena uh, is engaged in punishment that uh, is dramatically disproportionate to the level of the the, uh, the crime in this particular case. And then, of course, there's uh, questions of, of truth. And uh, when we learn our children's stories about our religion, whatever our religion uh, happens to be that we are born into, uh, there's always the question, is, uh, is this story true? Is this really the way the gods and the goddesses are? And how do I know that my religion's stories are the true stories about the gods? And in this case, if we say that these are you know, traditional Greek myths and these are the kinds of stories, and the Arachne story is uh, is one of them, that would be uh, would be circul- circulating and being being quite popularly. If it's the truth, then there does seem to be some uh, rather disturbing implications for it because one of the things that religion has traditionally served the function of is providing not only an explanation for the kind of the origin and the order of the universe, but as a a source of morality and standard religious moralities will say that the gods are the source of our moral standards and we should turn to them for a listing of the things that we are supposed to do and the things that we are not supposed to do. And on top of that, we are supposed to emulate the gods and goddesses to the extent that we are capable of doing so, that they serve not only as the cognitive source of our moral principles, but they serve as the role models that we are to uh, to try to emulate in our own behavior. But if it's the case that maybe these stories aren't true, uh, that's going to take us in a certain direction, and that's going to imply that if they're not true, then where are we going to get our moral code from and our moral principles from? And either we're going to have to get a different religion or we're going to have to make them up or discover them ourselves. But even if these stories are true of the gods, and it seems like we don't have a good set of role models from the gods here, that the gods may be admirable in some respects, but they also have flaws in various other respects. And in that sense, they are not going to be that much different from, uh, from, from we humans, that we will have our admirable traits, but we also will have our flaws. And if it's hard for the gods to uphold what are appropriate moral standards, and they don't seem to be from all the other stories that we know about the gods, really that much more or less successful than human beings are, then maybe we should not be holding the gods up on a pedestal with respect to moral sanction, moral adulation, and maybe we should be relying on our own resources much more. And again, I go back to a childhood example. As we grow to maturity, hopefully we have good parents, but at a certain point we do realize that our parents make mistakes that they are not necessarily morally flawless human beings. And so what we then say is, for me, as a, as, as a young human being growing to adulthood, the development of my moral character is not simply going to be a matter of doing what my parents say but not what they do, or just copying whatever it is that my parents do, but thinking for myself about what's under my control, what standards I should be setting for myself, and then relying on myself to live up to those standards to the best of my ability. And on that point, I think the story, and this is why I'm uh, pushing right on this story, I think that this story, with all of these themes that it's putting out, are is a very rich soil for people to start thinking about ethics in a unique way. That it's not a simply an uncritical adulation of the gods, a debasement right, of human beings, a giving all of the credit to the gods and not challenging the gods, seeing human beings as needing then to think of for themselves and act for themselves on these ethics issues. And to the extent that you have that soil being laid in Greek mythology in its formal religion, it's then a hypothetical explanation for why it was the Greeks that then were the first to start developing a philosophical ethics. Now, this uh, story's origins are, uh, to my knowledge, lost in the mists of history. But I do want to put a couple of other names out there. I mentioned earlier Thales and his importance for the origin of metaphysics, Parmenides a little bit later than Thales. 
and the origins of epistemology. I do want to suggest the name Hesiod, a uh, Greek poet, but a kind of a didactic poet in many respects, who uh, was either a, a, a kind of a rough contemporary of, of Homer. Every time I go back to the literature, they're adjusting the dates, it seems. But Hesiod is a giant step in my estimation toward a philosophical ethics. And what you find in him is explicit attention to the stories of Greek mythology and a recognition that if those stories are true, they are not a very good source for religious morality and not very really a good guidance for human beings to follow. And so what you find is uh, is Hesiod uh, recommending a kind of purification of the stories in the direction of making them more principled, more more uniform, and the uh, the foibles and the weaknesses of the gods are taken away. Those are just human poets of earlier generations trying to make a good story and humanize these godlike characters, but that's not really what the gods are like. So what we're looking for then is universal principles and, and a source that is going to be a more eternal source for those principles. And that already is a significant direction, a step rather in the direction of a, of a philosophical ethics. And then I think that's the tradition that someone like Socrates, then uh, a couple of centuries later, is going to take and work into a, kind of a brilliant groundwork for how to think about philosophical ethics. You're listening to Open College on the Possibly Correct Network with renowned philosopher and author, Dr. Stephen Hicks. A podcast to explain the chaos, taking an in-depth look into how postmodernism is affecting the modern world and your lives without you even realizing it. Stay up to date with the latest releases and news from Dr. Hicks by following the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Minds.com and Gab, or sign up to our email list at www.opencollegepodcast.com. While you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a view on your chosen media player. You can check out all our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com.